Funding for Pierre Frenet's Cuisine Rapide is made possible by Caroline Importers Limited, Teaneck, New Jersey. Style cooking. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm Pierre Franet. This is Cuisine Rapid. Today I'm going to cook bistro food. Everybody talk about bistro. Bistro they've been around for many many years, and suddenly they come back to life. You know, bistro food. This is food that I like to do, and I enjoy doing it. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Do, do it yourself. So my first recipe. It's going to be asper et jambon mornay, which is asparagus tips with ham and cheese sauce. So what do we need? We need 24 asparagus, which I have right here. They weigh about 2 pounds. 24 slices of ham. This is very good ham. Make sure when you buy it, it's not the, tell the guy who slices it not to slice it too thin. To begin, I have to peel the asparagus. So, I have uh, the asparagus, you know, a lot of people, they don't spill asparagus. I peel them. There's a reason for that. First of all, you could eat almost the whole asparagus, and uh, it, the color comes out very nicely, and sometimes the, the, the skin is very tough. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to cook the asparagus. I got some boiling water right here. I put a little pinch of salt to it. And we're going to cook that very quickly, about a minute. We don't want to overcook them because they're going to cook some more. All right, the asparagus I'm cooking. I'm going to make the sauce. What I need here, I have three tablespoons of butter. I'm going to add three tablespoons of flour. You know, lately I'm using, it's not something new, but I'm using one dry flour. One dry flour, sometimes I call it in my recipe instant flour in the New York Times. One dry flour makes it very, it's easy to bind, and it makes the sauce very, very light. We cook that very quickly like this. We bind it, we have to cook the flour and the butter together. Otherwise it gives it not a very good taste to it. It tastes like uh, paste, you know. Alright, now, see this bubbling little bit here? That's the time to add the, the milk. Okay, we bind this little bit of salt. See, it binds very quickly. Some white paper, little bit of this. Fresh nutmeg, I, I like the flavor of nutmeg, oh, the wrong side. Little bit of it, about a one little teaspoon. Oh, it's burning too fast. Little bit of cayenne pepper. <laughs> All right, see it's cooked. It's got to boil. It's got to simmer for for a while, and then to this, I'm gonna add one yolk of egg. That's the way I do my yolk. Easy. We're gonna bind this very quickly. I'm gonna add the, the Gruyere. So now I bind the gruyere right here, and the sauce is done. All right. Now my asparagus are cooked. And I'm going to drain this right here, very carefully. We don't want to break the tip of the asparagus. Then, with this dish, I'm going to make something that I like very much. You know, we're talking about bistro food. So I'm going to make something that I like. It's straw potatoes, pump pie in French. It's, it's very typical 
in the bistro, you know. So I'm going to make sure the fat is right. It's not, it's not hot enough. But meanwhile, we have some spaghetti already done here. We need about 24, so what we do, we take a one slice spaghetti like this. Very simple. We take one slice of ham. I want to see what's going on here. The fat has got to be at the right temperature, which it is now. Put the asparagus right here, and you roll it in. You know, I do that sometimes too. You should try it. You could use, I use uh, endive. I cook the endive, and I roll that around. It's not bad at all, you know. All right, now we taste this. Good. It got to be seasoned right. So we put the sauce right over like this. Nice flavor coming through. I wish you could smell this. We got to cover, you know, basically everything. We got enough sauce to cover everyone. I want to clean the edges because it's going to burn. It's a bistro food. We don't want, we don't want that to be too neat, you know. But it's got to be neat. Okay, I got the, the Parmesan cheese, which I'm going to put on top. Spread it out evenly. And then, I will, I'm going to put that on the brawler until it gets brown, very light brown, lightly brown. I'm going to put that, I got the brawler on here. I'm going to put that on the bottom shelf this way. And I want to leave the door open a little bit, like this. I want to make those potatoes. All right, now, to make the potatoes, of course, you got to slice the potatoes. <laughs> I have a gadget here. It's called a mandolin. It's uh, sold all over. United States, all the good shops, everybody has it. It's made in France. But it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, you have to be very careful when you use this because it's very sharp. When you buy this, most of the time today, this, this one is very old. I'm not kidding, I had this thing for over 30 years. So now finally the design, something will go over like a guard. You cannot cut yourself. But I'm so used to use that because you, Cut, cut so many different kind of potatoes with these gadgets. You could make french fry, you know, they, they are anything. So you pick up the potatoes like this and you just go like this, see? You shred it, see? Makes a long strip like this, see? You have to take your time, make sure not to cut your fingers, you know. I'm so used to it, I used to do it very fast, but I want to go slowly like this. Okay. Now, those potatoes, they have to be washed in clean water, but two times, and then you have to dry them, and you dry them, you make sure, you know, they in a the towel, because if you put that in hot fat, you got a bump shell in there, you know, so... And when you use a deep fryer, make sure you put the oil only one third of the height of the, 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 the pot you're going to use. So this is about, yes, it's about 330 degrees. Now, as a safety thing, precaution, you use a, a it's called an araignée in French, you know, Spider-Man. You put the, the if you use that, if you don't use a basket, you put the spider 
right in there. You put a few potatoes at a time. You see, because it's going to bubble, right? And the moisture is going to be released, so you have to be careful. So if you see the, the bubble coming up, you go like this, see? You're, you lift it up right away. So you have to be very careful, but uh, I'm going to show you how to do it, see? See, it takes a while, but it's fun to do, you know? Okay, now I want to check my... Uh, I think I'm going to move it up a little bit. See, it's bubbling nicely, but I want to finish them up on top. I'll go back to this here. See, and they change color very quickly. When they start to change color, you have to stay with it. Because you're going to see them right in front of your eyes, getting darker. They're getting there. See, that's done. Very good. Maybe a little bit of salt. Look at that. Beautiful. And they're crunchy. They're crisp. Let's not pull around with this. All right. Okay. Okay, look. See, it's nice and bubbling. Look at that. Beautiful. All right. I'm going to make, try to make one serving. About four asparagus per person. Put right in there, like this. I'm going to put some potatoes with it. It goes well with it, I tell you. Right in the side like this. Whoop, it's hot, believe me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to test this. Just the tip of one. No, on the back. Very good. Try to take some potatoes in the same time. The, the potatoes are crisp and together when you chew everything together, I tell you, it's a beautiful flavor and a good feeling in your mouth. Bistro a la Frené. Next up, behind the scenes. This time, an American bistro, the Boiler Room Cafe. In the foothills of the Berkshire Mountains in western Massachusetts, in a creaky old building that once manufactured horse and buggy whips, is a restaurant called The Boiler Room. You enter a narrow end of the dining room with aged wood and brick walls and red lacquer tables. The other side of the room is more cozy and warm, with white tablecloths, paintings, and book-lined walls. The Boiler Room is not a sophisticated restaurant. It has a homey and highly personal menu, featuring simple American fare and exceptional home-baked breads and desserts. And now we join Pierre and Michelle Miller, the chef and owner. You know, Michelle, I know you're very famous for your fruit pie, so I came all the way from New York City in western Massachusetts in the Berkshire to see you doing a fruit pie for me. So what kind of pie are you going to do? Well, welcome to the boiler room. I'm glad you came all this way. Uh -huh. And uh, we've been waiting all winter for the rhubarb to come up, and here it is. I see you've got a beautiful rhubarb here. Freshly cut from Taft Farms. So what else are you going to do with it? Well, I thought today we'd uh, use uh, some canned sour-pitted cherries. Sometimes you use fresh cherry when you get them in season? Yep, and then we pit them ourselves. And to make the filling, we'll use um, five tablespoons of flour. What are you going to mix that in here? Mm -hmm. Flour. Did you ever use cornstarch? Um, or arrowroot? Could you do that? Could you do that? I've never used arrowroot. I've used cornstarch to make the plum crumb pie. I see. But flour is just as good, right? Have I put five or six in there? I put six. <laughs> well, we better take one out then. Yes. And we're going to put in a, quor a cup and a quarter of sugar. If you use only cherry, you put less sugar? Yeah, if I was doing all on all cherry pie, I would use three quarters of a cup of sugar with I three see. tablespoons. So you can figure about a, a, third, a quarter of a cup of uh, 
sugar per tablespoon of flour. So the, the sugar change with according to the, the fruit you're using? Well, the, you know, rhubarb is tart, especially, yeah, so, so. You put a little more, yes. So we'll so blend this together. And you can use a spoon if you this want This is for one pie. This is for one pie and a pinch of salt. And then I'll put part of the filling in the bottom. Mm-hmm. And you put that evenly in the bottom. Mm-hmm. And if you really haven't had enough butter in the crust, I suppose we could put some butter on top of the fruit, too. I see, but you have But I'm not butter. going to do that, because I have enough butter. <laughs> I'm going to put a little bit. Oh, and then we'll put our cherries on top. You have about two cups. Mm -hmm. You have a little more than two cups here, no? Yes. No juice. No juice. We've, we've theoretically drained these cherries very mm -hmm. much, because... As you know, rhubarb gives a, a lot of water. And today I'm going to put something a little special in. What's that? Some cherry marnier. How much are you going to put of that? Oh, I think a tablespoon would be good. Yes. I think that's going to make it very special, you know. So you're going to put, what, two tablespoons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought one tablespoon. Would, one would you tablespoon? like me to put another tablespoon? I don't know. You're making the pie. I Let's don't know. try another tablespoon. Yeah, okay. you know, it won't hurt, I'm sure. All right. There we go. Okay. We shall see. So this pie has been cooled now. Yes, and it's ready to cut. So I can't wait, you know. Well, let's not. All right. It's a little juicy. How about this big? A small piece. Oh, me. shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> and it has... You want to... One. Okay. Oh, it smells like rhubarb and it smells like cherries. Here we go. Sometimes you have to use a serving spoon to serve the first piece. Still, of uh, very hot. Okay. I like my pie warm a little bit, you know. Look at that. The nice green with the red. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's not really hot, you know. It's just lukewarm. Well, if we had waited a little bit longer, it probably would have been. Well. It's very good, you know. <laughs> the combination of all those flavors together is very nice. A little more sherry again, and pie. And Do you think there's enough cherry liqueur in there? I think it's just beautiful. Great. Michelle. <laughs> cherry rhubarb pie from the Boiler Room Cafe. Now back to Pierre in the kitchen. My next bistro recipe is going to be monkfish in red wine sauce. This is a dish, I'm very fond of it. It's because in Burgundy, we do that fish, it's, that dish, I'm sorry, we do that dish, it's called matelot. And matelot is made the same way, but what we do, we use fresh water fish, different kind of fish, like eels, carp, and so on, pike. So I'm very, very fond of this. Now, to do this recipe, we're going to need four pounds of monkfish, which I have right here. This is the way you see the monkfish in a, in a fish house or a fish shop. Best, most of the time, they come like this. You know, that is the skin on top. It has to be removed. This is the, the side of the bone, and this is the side of the skin. Monkfish is a very ugly fish. They have a skin, we have skin it out like a rabbit almost. But this is what is left, but this got to go. So what I did here, this is what I got right here, okay? I trim it, it's ready to be cut. Now, this is the monkfish I'm gonna cut. Very easy. We cut it like in half, like this. And uh, we cut, no, about an inch cube like this. Okay, done. Now, to make the sauce, now, I'm going to show you how to do it. 
We need three tablespoons of butter, which I have right here. I'm going to add a quarter cup of chopped shallots. The butter is very hot, so the pan is very hot. We don't want to burn the shallots because we're going to give a, some kind of bitter taste to it. And then I'm going to add a little bit of garlic, very little garlic. We stir it. We add the parsley sprig. I got the thyme, the parsley sprig. I got the bay leaf. I got the everything here. And two cloves. All right. Now, I'm going to put about three tablespoons of flour to bind the sauce. When you make a brown sauce like this, you never use a whisk to mix your flour. Always use a wood spatula or something like it, but never a whisk. And then I'm going to add one bottle of wine, dry red wine from Cotroti. It's got to be a gutsy wine because this is bistro food. Now, I'm going to add two cups of fish broth, which I made fresh. We're gonna put, bring that to a bowl, to simmer, and uh, we're gonna cook that for about 20 minutes. So you make sure to stir it well. Okay, I have a sauce here, it's been cooking for 20 minutes, see? That's the way it looks like, see the difference? 20 minutes, the color change, and uh, and uh, reduce, of course, and uh, give a little body to it. I'm going to move that here because it's done. Now, I got about two tablespoons of butter, the onions, the mushrooms. So we cook that with a little bit of salt, like this. It has to be brown. So now I'm going to add the fish right in here. We're going to put some cognac in here. Some, got some money cognac here. Uh, I said two tablespoons. You could put one, two. You know where I come from, Burgundy, like I said, this is called Matlot. Uh, we use eau de vie. My grandfather used to make a the eau de vie is kind of moonshine, but that was legal in France those days. And uh, so that's why we used uh, to deglaze with uh, the wine and the eau de vie. But the cognac, then it was good too, you know. Maybe better. Okay, I got this sauce, which has been cooked, boiling for about 20 minutes. We're going to put that right over. And uh, I'm gonna, it's very important when you strain a sauce like this, you got all the goodies in here, you know? You got shallots, you got garlic, a little bit, you know, clove and all this. So you press it, so, with a, especially with a whisk, this is very good, you see? This is called a chinois, a china cap. This is very, very good. Uh, for anybody who loves cooking, we should have one. Okay. We squeeze that. We're gonna bring this to a bowl like this, to simmer. And it's got to be simmering for about five minutes. No more, we don't wanna overcook it. So I got some potatoes here. I wanna taste it first. Tasting is the key, huh? It's gonna be fine. All right, like, I got have those potatoes, which I've been cooking for 15 minutes. We don't want to overcook them, so we got to taste them like this. See, they, they, they're just right. They're not overcooked. They're very nice. I'm going to drain them.
they have to be well drained. And when the fish start to simmer, we are going to put the potatoes. They start to simmer, I'm going to add the potatoes to this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to move that right next to me. Right in here. Okay. Make sure the potatoes are in the and we we'll cook with the wine a little bit. They have to simmer with the wine. Now, this is simmering good. I'm gonna double check the seasoning. Great. Okay. I got some crouton in here. Hey, I forgot about it. Oof. They almost burn. That's what it look like. This is good with anything, those crouton, you know, salad or whatever. Okay. I'm going to show you a serving, what a serving look like. It's almost like a soup. It's a stew. Put a little more fish in here. See, the fish have to stay firm. If you want to, you could do that almost with any kind of fish, you know, I mean, make sure to use a firm fish, tile fish, pike, you know, things like that. And uh, believe me, it's great. So, I'm gonna put some uh, more fish right here, here. I'm gonna dip that in a sauce like this. This is good. Put it right over like this. And uh, this is my bistro food for the day. Monkfish with red wine sauce. Another basic bistro recipe from Pierre Frenet's Cuisine Rapide. Funding for Pierre Frenet's Cuisine Rapide has been made possible by Carillon Importers Limited, Teaneck, New Jersey. This is PBS. Pierre's quick and easy recipes from today's show, plus more than 250 others, are contained in this companion cookbook. 65 step-by-step -step line drawings guide you through Pierre's classic technique. To order this 384-page hardcover book, call 1-800-635-COOK. The cost is $22.50 plus $2 shipping and handling. Credit cards are accepted or send your check to P.O. Box 37142, Omaha, Nebraska, 68137.